Our second reading comes from Thessalonians 4, sorry, verses 13 through 18. And regarding the question, friends, that has come up about what happens to those already have died and been laid to rest, we don't want you in the dark any longer. First off, you must not carry on over them like people who have nothing to look forward to, as if the grave were the last word. Since Jesus died and broke loose from the grave, God will most certainly bring back to, those, back to life those who died in Jesus. And then this, we can tell you with complete confidence, we have the Jesus' word on it, that when Jesus comes again to get us, those of us who are still alive and will not get a jump on the dead and leave them behind, in actual fact, they'll be ahead of us. The risen Jesus will give the command. Archangel thunder, God's trumpet blast. The dead in Christ will rise, they'll go first. Then the rest of us who are still alive at the time will be caught up with them into the clouds to meet our creator. Oh, we'll be walking on air, and then there will be one huge family reunion. So reassure one another with these words. There are moments that the words don't reach There is suffering too terrible to name You hold your child as tight as you can And push away the unimaginable The moments when you're in so deep It feels easier to just swim down The Hamiltons move uptown and learn to live with the unimaginable I spend hours in the garden I walk alone to the store and it's quiet uptown I never liked the quiet before I take the children to church on Sunday a sign of the cross at the door and I pray that never used to happen before. You see him in the street, walking by himself, talking to himself happily. Philip, you would like it uptown, it's quiet uptown. at where we are look at where we started I know I don't deserve you Eliza but hear me out that would be enough if I could spare his life if I could trade his life for mine he'd be standing here right now and you would smile and that would be enough I don't pretend to know the challenges we're facing I know there's no replacing what we've lost and you need time but I'm not afraid I know who I married just let me stay here by your side that would be enough. Sitting in the street, walking by your side, talking by your side, happy. Eliza, do you like it uptown? It's quiet uptown. that the words don't reach there's a grace 
too powerful to name. We push away what we can never understand. We push away the unimaginable. They are standing in the garden. Alexander by Eliza's side. She takes his hand. It's quiet uptown. Forgiveness. Can you imagine forgiveness? Can you imagine if you see him in the street, walking by your side, talking by your side, half pity? They are going through the unimaginable. So as I mentioned earlier in the announcements, this weekend we remember our veterans. And Veterans Day is observed today, or yesterday rather, November 11th, which honors our military veterans, that is all of those folks who have served in service to our country. If you are comfortable doing so with those who have served at any point or are perhaps you'd like to just raise your hand so we can acknowledge you. Um, in fact, would you stand, please? Thank you. And thank you to the families who support those who serve. You know, Armistice, the, the Veterans Day sign on the, I didn't know this until I started looking at it, or I had forgotten, on the 11th day of November at 11 o'clock in the morning and on the 11th day of the month. The 11th month, the 11th day, and the 11th hour. Uh, and that, of course, was in 1918. The, the headline that day read of the New York Times, Armistice Signed End of the War. Berlin Served by Revolutionists. New Chancellor Begs for Order ousted Kaiser flees to Holland. And then in 1954, what was referred to as Armistice Day before was renamed to the day as we know it today, Veterans Day. And it was, it was a time where the optimism following the war, you might recall that it was referred to as the war to end all wars. And that was optimistic at the time, is still a hopeful thing today, but unless, unless you've served in the military, I don't believe you can know what it is to serve in the military. Or unless you've fought in a war, I don't believe you know what it is to have been in a war, to have seen the victims of wartime. I don't think you can really understand it unless you've been there, what those atrocities and sacrifices are like, other than perhaps intellectually stories are told, then certainly it's an emotional response. But it's always from a distance, unless we're always part of what it is we're describing. We, we listen to learn about it. And in truth, I think that it's probably something that is just not possible to grasp, but nonetheless important to honor. But something happens, doesn't it? We learn to emphasize, empathize with others, and that happens to a large degree because of compassion. Because we have a compassion for the person we know who's telling us the story about their experiences, whatever it might be, in this case, talking a bit about wartime. There's something in the human condition that has us connected. 
And there's a sort of tripwire, if you will, that sets itself off when something happens that is really big, for lack of a better word. Something happens that makes us forget our differences and brings us about as closely together as we can get. War has done that. Other events have done that. It happens when we come here. It happens when we get married. I haven't been yet, but some of you have. And you come together and the families are connected in warm ways. And the birth of children as another example. But speaking about the conflicts of World War I, then these, these things mobilize us in a way that prevent the divisions from taking over. The motivating force creates a bond. And that bond does something that's not possible alone. The impact of that bond is not only emotional, intellectual, but it is very much a physical and spiritual response. It is why I think it's right to continue to be concerned and attentive to things like terrorism and military nations, rogue nations especially, whose unified consciousness, that which brings them together, is perhaps more terrifying than the weapons they use because that unified consciousness will use the weapons. It's a way of saying if you are crazy enough to use nuclear weapons, then you are crazy enough to use them. These are concerns. But it also works that if you are faithful enough to fight for what needs to be fought for, then you will fight for what needs to be fought for. It's how we change things. In the blending and the bending sometimes of consciousness, there is something that has a deep, deep impact. There's a theory, you know, and there's some data to support it that following 9-11, when the entire world was struck with the sadness and the shock and the memories that come flooding in right now for a lot of us, when that happened, it was so enormous and immense that it actually affected computer systems around the world that changed in the energy. Now, that sounds a little far out until we go into a report that's been produced by Princeton University's Global Consciousness Project that suggests that our mind's awareness of the world in which we exist can synchronize under great conditions and to act coherently. Or as Roger Nelson from the center says, we interconnect, we interact, we're not isolated. My consciousness inside my skull and yours extend out into the world. We're like neurons in a giant brain that we know nothing about. Or the Dalai Lama puts it this way. Some ancient masters of great wisdom and power had no master teacher of man, but connected to great spirit of truth, nature, the ultimate creative source. Therefore, we must assume infinite wisdom comes from great spirit of truth and is within us all. Now, if the Dalai Lama is correct, then it would seem that the mutual shared consciousness we have of the divine, that spark that I spoke about, can be stirred en masse with enormous consequences for good. And of course, other things can be stirred with enormous consequences for not so good. But Jesus says this to us in Matthew 21, 21. He says, truly, I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to the fig tree when he shriveled the tree, but also you can say to this mountain, go, throw yourself in the ocean, and it will be done. I have never doubted that if every person on this planet wanted the same mountain to be lifted up into the sea and believed that they could do it, it would happen like that. 
I have never doubted that if every person on this planet wanted the end to violence, that it would happen. I have never doubted that if everyone on this planet wanted peace, we would have peace, harmony and understanding, sympathy and trust abounding, no more falsehoods or derisions, golden living dreams of visions, mystical crystal revelation, and the mind's true liberation. O oh, ye of little faith, isn't that the same as, O oh, ye of limited minds to understand, why do you desist from believing in me and these things I teach you? How long do you think I will be with you? Will you remember? Will you enter into the world with the consciousness I have given to you of a creator that loves you and just wants you to love others as you are loved? What makes you stiff-necked and resistant? What but your ego, E-G-O, for easing God out, maybe? What but your ego makes you resist the good news, the truth, the light? And the Old Testament, Job in 12.12 12 says, with the ancient is wisdom, and in length understanding. It's not going to happen like that. But it's been happening. It is now. Look around. It's happening. Now, all of this wasn't just made up, you know. They didn't just make this stuff up, all these teachings. They were far from understood from the beginning, but the universal long before they were taught. The stories are meant to teach what could not be understood. Think about that. If we understood everything, would we need the stories? Would we need the many ways to say it? How many teachers in this room, or have been teachers in this room? Did you teach in just one way? Or did you find the ways to teach to the students who needed a different way to learn? Did you find different stories and different examples and different expressions and media and music and jokes even, right? Well, this morning's first reading says as much that the real beginning to wisdom is to desire instruction with all your heart. And I think that includes wanting to teach with all your heart. There's an exchange of wisdom there. That love for instruction expresses itself in careful reflection. We need to be aware of ourselves, don't we? And to look at our actions, to see how our thoughts become the things we say and the things we do and the habits and how they affect others. This reflection of how we interact with one another, the impact we have on others, the care we give to all those in our lives, how that changes things. And it says if you love wisdom, you will keep her laws. There are many laws of wisdom, and they find their roots in places like these. Truth, love, justice, mercy. And it says if you are attentive to the laws of wisdom, you can be assured you will live forever. Well, to her laws, the laws of Sophia, wisdom, she was the wisdom that existed long before everything else that there is something in these laws that brings that harmony and understanding that transcends time and space and eternity as we know it with what we refer to as heaven without really knowing what heaven is. We just know there's a transcendence. There is more. And if you live forever, you will be near to God. Well, as we approach eternity, as we approach wisdom, each step we take comes closer. What Jesus referred to, or John said Jesus referred to in 14.6, I am the truth and the light and the way. Love one another as I have loved you. Then they will know you are my disciples. Share the good news, leave them in awe, be the change in yourself you hope to find in others. And I might add, practice, practice, practice. And I'm still practicing. I'm still a student of all of this. This is all so far beyond us that if we wait to understand it, we're going to miss the entire show. Now, all of this emerges in a sense for me 
by considering what it means to be a follower of Jesus, a Jewish rabbi and prophet, and more. And you know, Mary was a Jew too, just in case you were wondering, and Joseph. And I think it's in the passage of Paul to the Thessalonians that the meaning of Jesus' life in the revelation of God the Creator to us and all is stated in relation to death. So Jesus says, Paul says, and regarding this question, friends, that has come up about what happens to those already who have died and been laid to rest, we don't want you to be in the dark any longer. First off, you must not carry on over them like people who have nothing to look forward to, as if the grave were the last word. Since Jesus died and broke loose from the grave, God will most certainly bring back to life those who died in Jesus. It doesn't sound at least as far out as an idea, does it? As the fact that somehow our consciousness can impact the world around us. The fact that Jesus rose from the dead, whatever that risen Christ is, spiritually, physically, combination that is present today, that has broken the bonds of death, does that sound, doesn't that sound further out than the idea that maybe our consciousness can impact one another? We believe in things that are way out there because that's where there is. Doesn't this reveal the truth and the light and the way beyond even the smallest progress and understanding of our human and shared spiritual consciousness? In other words, Christianity. Christianity is a way of living that transcends all other ways of living in the revelation it brings of who and whose we are and what it is we are being called to do in and with our lives. Even if we've never heard of the word Christianity, even if we don't know what it means, if we're living like that as we are breathing, we are living in what Christianity is trying to teach us and what great religions are trying to teach us. The, the stories, the tales, the myths, the truths, the miracles and all are wonderful, but they are not meant for anything other than to reveal to you the immense presence of God and the power of God's love in our lives and what we can do with that. Now, I would not argue with Einstein on physics. Would anybody here argue with Einstein on physics? Neither would I. But I might talk to him a little bit about theology. And one of the things that he talks about in some of his writings is that we are so far beyond the possible limits of what we can understand that it really comes down. He gives a parable. He says, imagine if you were a child and you somehow found yourself in this immense library with books from floor to ceiling beyond what you could see, all written in different languages by different authors, and all of the knowledge of the world and universe was there, how could you possibly understand that? And he compares that to the ability to understand God. So for me, maybe for you, what I believe this comes down to is believing that we accept that we're not going to understand in all the ways the things we would like to understand, but that we believe we don't need to have every jot and tittle cross. We believe, and as we approach the eternity of living into wisdom, we approach the nearness of God, and we come to know the truth and the light and the way. We have power enormous power in the love that we've been given to share. And I believe that the good news is simply stated in the greatest commandment. What Jesus told us, to love God with all your heart and all your soul and all your might, to put yourself out there, to trust in that God, and then to love each other as yourself.
and that the things that we need to do in this world, the things that need to be changed, we are changing them. We are changing them by our very presence in every act of kindness, in every consideration of another, in every family member that we support or take care of, in every way we invite our youth to be part of our worship, and in the ways that we go out from here and interact with others. So bring with you what I think this divine spark is all about. It's the possibilities that are enormous and the fact that we are, in fact, changing the world. May it continue to be so. Amen. Thank you for your generosity in helping us to share God's love for all. We are grateful for all the ways you participate in the work of this ministry. And more than anything, we are most grateful that you are here. We welcome your offerings currently and invite you to place your prayer and information cards in the basket.
The divine is perhaps loud at times, but more often I think the divine is a quiet, quiet touch inside of us, a spark perhaps, and that maybe, maybe the word serenity is a description of that. That when we are serene, when we find our place in that, in that place of calmness and serenity, that there's a center there. And so with this prayer, think of serenity first, and then asking for the courage to change what we can, and to know the difference between what we can change and the things we need to accept. And let us go forward into this life with that spark for all to see, so they too can be amazed as we are. And before we go, remember those with us today who have come back. Jane, welcome back with us today. And all our guests who have joined us. And together, let us go forward to love God in all the ways we know God. Sliding down a mountain, I was going.